and welcome to a very special episode of Movie of the Year, the only podcast with the science and the screaming to determine the best movie for any given year. This year we are doing 1991, and because of the way it works out, our movie for tonight, Robin Hood, colon, Prince of Thieves, and that colon, Prince of Thieves, is actually kind of important, um, will not be in contention to win Movie of what? the Year. What? Is that a uh, statement of rule or a statement of content? Like what the movie that you watched? Uh, well, we'll get to that <laughs> well, in a second. But that's just how the rules work. It's it's any you don't want to go in knowing what movie will win. So we yeah. instantly took Robin Hood: Prince of Thieves off to make yes. the rest of the bracket more exciting. Clear out a little bit of room. That of course was Mike. Also joining me is Ryan, and we're just gonna have gentlemanly conversation today. This. Ryan is going to be my best friend for the next couple of months. Mike, there's nothing you could do about well, it. Who, who am I? If, so if you're Robin. Yeah. I'm king of friends. You're prince of friends. Oh, I'm definitely Friar Tuck. You're Friar Tuck? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that I'm Friar Tuck. He's sure. always drunk on wine. Greg is He's super religious. He's a real religious. big fucking yeah. asshole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will straight murder somebody. It, we'll get to this hopefully, but it is weird the way this movie ends with every principal character yeah. murdering no, somebody. That's, you get your own bad guy. It's yeah. war. And you kill him. <laughs> I know it's war, but it's like a lot of times in modern movies, if somebody, if like one of your main characters is going to kill somebody, which for a while got almost totally rare. It was right. like all bad guys were robots or constructs or something. But if it happens, you're like, Ew, I don't know. Yeah, you're I? like, oh, no. In this, I found each character, you. <laughs> like Friar Tuck commits murder. Yeah. Like he seriously loads this dude up with gold and pushes him out a oh, fucking window. Not just a dude. I think the ruler of the English church at the time. <laughs> and is that a thing? Like uh, people with glasses, like you wouldn't hit a fellow man in the cloth. Is that a common phrase? Yeah. The br- the brotherly bonds. Honestly, I think the different like sects of, of priests. So like the, the Franciscan monks versus the actual, like he's probably like a Jesuit priest. Right. Honestly, I think hate each other almost as much as like they hate non-religious people mm-hmm. or people from another or religion. More. People, people like, there are relatives of mine who say Catholics aren't Christians. Like, like, <laughs> man, they care about dogma so much. Yeah. And especially back in the day. Well, so it is Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Let me just ask you, I like to at the top of the show always ask, what is our history with this movie? Do we have it? Is it extensive? Let's start with Ryan. I've seen this movie 21 times. Yeah. 20 times a long time ago. Yeah. And then once this week. Uh, I was a huge fan of it. I think that I know. This was like one of the pillar movies of our childhoods right yeah. right yeah. and like another movie that we watched this season i watched the extended cut for the first time oh uh, terminator 2 mm-hmm. yeah. and i knew exactly right what was added what i had not seen before immediately uh i think that i can tell you guys explain to you guys why i loved it as a kid and i will also say based on how movie of the year works we will never watch a worse more poorly made movie we never have, and the I Terminator Two. Then That's Robin bold. Hood, Prince of Thieves. I cannot believe this fucking slot pile. <laughs> <laughs> it it feels made for like, hey kid, does your family only have those three channels, and nobody else you know does that? Watch this forever, over and over again. I saw this movie. The this and Men in Tights was a classic double feature in my household. We owned both of them, and so the <laughs> only time I would get confused is when I realized I was conflating the two movies at some point we're going to need to talk about on this show whether performers within this movie maybe thought they were (laughs) in a robin hood parody film that's definitely something that i want to talk about is the at some point is how everybody in this movie is kind of in a different space two performers from men in tights uh Patrick Stewart and Carrie Elloways were offered the roles they would go on to parody in this movie. <laughs> and I think Patrick Stewart had time conflicts, but Carrie Elloways said, no, this movie's dog shit. And so would later go on to like, no, I don't know if they took my no hard enough. <laughs> I'll let them know how much I hate their movie. Honestly, I haven't seen Men in Tights in so long. And I remember as a kid think- knowing that it was bad, which means it's bad, bad. Yeah. And yet I could see Carrie Elloways say, no, this one's better. Men in Tights is a fucking better written Better made movie. At least there's a tongue and a cheek. <laughs> Mike, you were the one that I feel like we all loved it as kids. It was foundational. But for you, I felt like you had like the 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 shiniest shimmer from it. Do you does that still It it's this might be the hardest movie I've ever watched as an adult where like the so much of my rational brain is like, oh, but you you know what good movies are now, Mike, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> it, it's like yeah, it was so hard to separate childhood wonder and love, and it's like one of the early wonder. things that probably childhood, there's <laughs> movies filled with so much childhood wonder. Made me fall in love with fantasy and violence and like that kind of stuff. It was definitely one of those entry points, and like I I know it's not good, but it's so good. It, it might be everything I need from a movie. <laughs> I found myself. I'm basically both of your positions as well. I like this was just like I'd go to the video store on the weekend and my parents would be like rent two or three videos and i would as like rent something that i had seen a million Mm -hmm. times as i would something new well you need backup right yeah if the first if the thing you haven't seen is boring you have robin hood and as a backup and what this movie had for me was a kid when i was a kid was uh robin hood uses a bow and arrow yes and that was like 100 percent of what i wanted to see like a cool bow and arrow okay once in a while those arrows are on fire yeah (laughs) right for no reason that still works on me today he's just like i should grab a flaming one i I, I, him doing the flaming arrow mm -hmm. at the camera that i remembered when i saw it in the movie i was like oh yeah that was in the preview, and that was the moment I turned to my parents, and I was like, we are seeing this yeah, movie. I, I had a real bow and arrow when I was six years old, probably because of this movie, and my parents are bad parents. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, like, you know, little kids, like, hold their action figure while they watch X-Men or whatever. I would hold my real bows and arrows while watching this movie and be like, yeah, kill those guys, Robin. And while you use your toy, for me, it was a toy. For my kid, it was real. Yeah. Um, you have to do out loud. Dun, 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 oh, dun, dun, yeah. dun. That's the MVP of this movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. And we are definitely going to get a chance to talk about that when we come back. <laughs> Gentlemen, I ask you this. Like, what the fuck is this movie? Is it possible for a mashup of every genre, tone, level of seriousness, and sense of humor to be mixed together and still make a good movie? I mean, Greg, you said earlier the different performances that we get in this movie. Um I know there is a story with Alan Rickman that he turned it down a million times, and then they said... Including during every scene. <laughs> like, I don't want to yeah. do this. <laughs> and then they said, you have carte blanche with your performance. And th- let's just start there. Um, <laughs> he's a pot filter Hall of Famer. He yes. is, dude. Uh, but, and the extended version does not do him any favors. Like, he, it's almost all him. Yes. But I'm... People say that he is the saving grace of this movie. I think that he is giving one of the worst performances in the movie. Well, do you know what's wrong with it? Is you d- in like an improv group or sketch group, you never want somebody to start being like, I am the star. Like you do want all ships to rise equally. And Plus, keep in mind, this is two years after Nicholson took over a movie called Batman. Uh-huh. And so he, he clearly wants that. He also took two comedian friends and they sat all day at a pub and just redid his lines. Because I knew he was allowed to say anything. Is that a true story? Yes. And that's how it feels, right? Doesn't it feel like two people outside of the movie? There are two separate times in this movie where somebody behind him says something that is frustrating to him, and he crosses his eyes and then rolls them and turns around and looks back. (laughs) He definitely, at times, feels like he's in the Mel Brooks version of this movie. This is what I felt like until you told that story, which, by the way, you would have gotten so many points for all the (laughs) toys you've been dropping. But... Until you told that story, I imagined him at the end of every scene being like, what's the director's name? Kevin Reynolds. Kevin. Um, I'm really looking for the ceiling. <laughs> so could you tell me when I hit it? And the, Kevin was just like, more, more. And he was like, seriously, like, I'm going to get as big as I can get until you tell me to back off so I can see where the range is. And throughout the movie, it gets bigger right. and bigger and bigger until he is like, just like frothing at the literal eyed, mouth. And yeah, literally frothing at the mouth in scenes. And again, we obviously we have proof that we love him because we built a statue of him in our Hall of Fame. But when you look at uh, Hans Gruber, mm-hmm. or, that's what I think is, was too big in his mind. That was too big in his mind. I think he, I think at some point somebody said to him, or he decided. I want to do the Hans Gruber thing where I steal the show right. a little bit. But he steals the show because of how subtle he is, how cool he is, yeah. you know? Between Hans Gruber and the other one I was going to say was Galaxy Quest uh-huh. of just, I will be the quietest one in the room and that, and I will still steal every scene. Yeah. And that, like... He wanted to try the other thing. Right. right. Yeah. But it, it's, it's uh, you know, a weird, bad, clownish performance, but still some of the best line readings. It's mostly bad, I can admit that, but there's some of the line readings are some of the best Alan Rickman line readings ever. Maybe, again, too young, but the, because it'll hurt more, it's fucking good, man. Like, I think he is, like, it's not only is he bigger than anybody else, it feels like he's like, but I don't want people to think the sheriff is cool. Like, he is a buffoon, and yeah. Rickman yeah. plays him as I th- one. I think it's a perfect amalgamation of Hans Gruber and Dr. Frankenfurter. That's the performance <laughs> yeah, that we dude. get here. That's really, that's really what it's like somewhere. But those are two characters that we love. Like, yeah, this, is, right. this is a freak. <laughs> and the thing is, like, 
couldn't he do that same performance in a movie that is more tonally consistent with that? Because the thing is, Kevin Costner is in a completely different movie and honestly right. never should have been in this movie. Like, does not sell it, is is so uncomfortable. I mean, he's as out of place as Alan Rickman is. Do you, and then also the Maid Marian character, she's like in a historical drama. Yeah, she's like, in a different movie for where sure. Where the hell are ever Like, nobody is on the same page in this entire movie. Uh, if we're just like, just to keep listening to stuff, <laughs> fucking Friar Tuck looks at the camera at the end and tells, well, tells the audience to leave. Friar like, Tuck and the sheriff might be in the same movie. How Maybe. goofy and yeah. big they are, like, and that's he has the, but he has the same thing Kevin Costner does, where it's just like, I'm gonna like, kind of do like a lilt to my voice, but sometimes I'll just be southern. Sometimes I won't. Yeah, I mean, and, sometimes this is Kevin Costner narrating Dances with Wolves, like that slow monotone that has absolutely it's not a bad British accent, literally none. no attempt. Yeah, and I know that's like the most memorable thing from the movie. That's what everybody says, but I started thinking. And I'm a fan. Does this movie sort of make you surprised that Kevin Costner was a star for as yes. long as he was? Well, I'm surprised that this is not... Maybe it is, and we just don't know because we were kids at the time. But this should be talked about as like a how did he survive this performance. The way Waterworld was he, talked he about. He personally has like four of those, right? The Postman as well. Uh, do you know what this, the water, Waterworld, and I think maybe the Postman have in common? Uh-huh. It's the two Kevins. Ah, no, no it's way. Waterworld or uh, Postman is uh, Costner directed. Oh, okay. But the the fact that Waterworld is directed by Kevin Reynolds, starring Kevin Costner, I think is very interesting because Robin Hood was such a hit, and the people who greenlit Waterworld mm-hmm. looked at box office receipts and not Nothing the movie. Else. If they looked at the movie, they would say, "This is fucking shambles. We can't give this guy a bigger budget." And I know Water. The story is Waterworld fell apart because. Uh-huh. It's hard to shoot on water. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the story is these are two incompetent people. But also, who? I, so they did a movie before this one that I cannot remember which one it is now. They did this, hated each other. The Kevins were at each other's throats throughout this movie and then did Waterworld. It's bananas, the stories of how they treated each other. This movie that they would be like, let's do another one. For me, the biggest story is not Kevin Costner doesn't do English accent and it's not um, Rickman's over the top performance. To me, honestly, the biggest swing and miss on this is that Kevin Costner should never be like in an Errol Flynn type role. Right? Where's he's not a, he buckles no swashes. That's a, that was the, there's uh, nothing in his movement vocabulary that indicates he can just suddenly grab onto a rope and then cut it and then fly up into the air. And they cut to stunt doubles always like with their face down yeah. and in the crook of their arm because that's why he has that mullet is because it was easy to yeah. recreate <laughs> another oh for double. sure you throw that bad wig on anybody there's one scene where towards the end where like we're at the other end of the hallway and he comes in and he stabs somebody into the hallway and then he walks towards the camera and he's like jumping and it looks like me at 12 <laughs> pretending I was like, oh, you, you are the lightsaber star wars <laughs> kid yes absolutely <laughs> there's a part where he takes an arrow and he rips off the fletching with his teeth why would you do that? What? Because it'll. He's trying to do a trick shot. I don't know. Because it'll hurt more. Like because it, it'll hurt more, cousin. <laughs> but like, but uh, all oh. like Kevin Costner is doing six different attempts at comedy yes. here. Oh, um, yeah. the whole like, there's all, there's all these times where people are basically looking in the camera after somebody delivers a line and like doing the cuckoo finger. Like, uh, are you serious right now? And then there's he's scared of the telescope. Yeah, like, <laughs> like I actually think that one's pretty. Good. A seam handsome that. Like I do like what this movie is. Yes, and especially in 1991 is good at is like Azim is the one is breaking all Muslim stereotypes, for, especially for this time period. Well, I think we've learned that throughout history, white men call people barbarians the ones that they're like threatened by and right. are jealous of. And this guy knows science, and it's just <laughs> like and he and because for him, imagine like for Azim. Going to England is like going back in fucking time. Yes. He <laughs> cannot believe what he's looking at. Like the, he comes from civilization, yes. and this age civilization. There's nothing like civilization but where he th- is. This telescope scene, which I do think is legit <laughs> funny, but is absurd. Is uh, they all see how far away the horses are. Azim looks to count and then hands it to Robin. Robin, while still holding the telescope <laughs> up, starts to try to grab his bow and is knocking everywhere well, as if he were like Austin Powers. Like yeah, right, he takes his sword out and then begins to stab the air in front of him. It's a one-two <laughs> punch because he looks over and he jumps and he almost falls off this yeah. wall and then he pulls it down and he sees that they're far away puts it back up to his eye then pulls the sword <laughs> yes. out how fucking stupid are you also isn't it all weird in 91 to watch kevin costner do a thing where he sneaks in a bow and like assembles it 
from a position, like an elevated position to try to like take someone out. I got such like JFK vibes watching him like assemble <laughs> that bow. He pulls it out of the staff. Right. And he's like putting it together. Which, yeah, I forgot this, that was in this season, but oh, that's whoa, perfect yeah. casting. That's like, you're asking him to be this like stoic, quiet yes. dude. There you go. It's going back to and like the whole. Every man. Yeah, exactly. The Waterworld thing is just box office receipts. There was this time where like, we're going to make Robin Hood. Get the biggest star you can. Do you want him to be like. Errol Flynn, or like, what do you mean? And no, just the biggest one. Kevin Costner said yes. All right, don't it's care. Like, Let's just, just put like him in teams there. that it's like sports teams that just are like, just get me the biggest the biggest names. stars. Yeah, right. I don't and care if like, they work together. These guys don't play together, and their positions don't work. And it's like, have you heard some of these names? Come <laughs> on, we're gonna be fine. <laughs> and I, I wonder if, like, like Rickman, we know the story and in, in his, but I wonder if Costner. At this point, he did JFK. He, he's had the career he's had. If he's sick of being every man, he's like, I'm going to show my range. Sure. You know, <laughs> and again, two years after Michael Keaton right. was Batman. Yeah. I feel like when he accepted the role, he was like, you'll make this work, Kevin. <laughs> and then during it, at some point, just went, it's not c- coming together. Like, I feel like this looks like the type of movie where we get an actor or a director's second movie in the year. Uh, you know, uh-huh. JFK's the baby. JFK, he's working with real, like, established talent. For this, it's like, and I'll make another movie. And you can just feel that he kind of doesn't have enough give a fuck, like, while he does it. And it's like this whole movie to him seems like he's just like, this is kind of a joke, isn't it? Do, do you know, I, I think it would work. And the, the moment I think... This is like the sell of if you were going to make this movie and pitch it to production studios is the he's not swashing buckles, but him and Maid Marian slowly spinning down, looking at each other. It's like, oh, you want to make a romance? I yeah. actually can. be. This is a boring romance but for moms and aunts. No, it's always I want to make a romance right now. Right. And then I want to make a comedy and then yeah. I want to make an right. action movie. And I think that Kevin Reynolds is thing. And like he is not a prolific director. Like Waterworld really kicked him out of the industry. Yeah, uh, but you can see – I feel like you can see his storyboards are one frame. Like, as mm-hmm. long as I get this one spin around yes. down or as long yeah. as I get the shot with the arrow uh, on fire, I don't fucking care about the rest. Let's just get to the next I, Yeah, I really post. don't. Yeah. And this movie, it has none of that cinematography where you feel it, but you don't really know why you're feeling it. No. Everything he does with the camera, he's like, hey, check this out. Now I'm kind of running holding the camera. Is that <laughs> I mean, there's, like, MTV music video editing style, and then there's, like – Okay, call action. It's a fight scene. And then just throw the camera. Yeah. Like, throw it up in the air, and whatever it catches is what we're putting in. Did you guys ever go to Summer Stage? Was that a thing on the West Coast uh, no. as kids? So, Summer Stage was uh, four younger kids, high schoolers, would put on plays throughout the summer. and what? They only allowed four kids in there? <laughs> yeah, four at a time. It was a very <laughs> private, intimate showing. This was, this feels like a Summer Stage production. Like, I'm just like, well, they're all having fun making it, yes. aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Wow, there's some talented kids at this school. <laughs> When we come back, another one of these interesting questions. We've gotten a Robin Hood movie every five to ten years for the last century. What does one need to be good? What does this movie have or need as far as the Loxley tropes go? You need to be a fox (laughs) to make people turned on. Like, literally, or just a handsome devil. Yes. There was another Robin Hood in 1991. Uh, Robin Hood, no subtitle, just Robin Hood. And it was another live action. And did you say that it was like for a, a made-for-TV movie? Yeah, it was made just... for Fox. Okay. Whoa. It's all, but it, didn't star a Fox. It's almost as good as this. And they shoot foxes a couple times so conspicuously <laughs> as if to be like, <laughs> we get remember it. Remember that cartoon <laughs> one? <laughs> you want to fuck this fox too, ladies? I think one weird choice is Robin Hood oftentimes is just like a man of the people. Mm-hmm. And in this one in particular, and in a couple others, he's like a lord and I don't love that. Mm-hmm. It's so weird f- to me that you would take an English story about an everyman who he uses a bow. That is an everyman's we- weapon, mm-hmm. really. And then make him a lord, especially in American retellings of it. Because it's like, no, his whole point is he's not from that rich class. Oh, interesting. I guess I didn't realize that. like, Because this was probably my first Robin Hood that like, I've read every version of him being that lord who's like i should learn more about the people yeah he's one of the good ones but <laughs> I, one of the problems i think with this movie is that it's like they listed every single thing every robin hood has ever done yes. and let's jam it in and the lord thing is really forced because and i think it's most evident when and this feels like such a tacked on thing in the script um robin and marion are hanging out 
Mm -hmm. And uh, she gives him a dagger that the camera focuses on for two or three minutes. Don't forget the dagger. (laughs) And Robin says, for no reason, uh, my father, after my mother died, fucked a peasant woman. Mm. And then I complained and he came home. And then we find out later that that's Christian Slater. But that's such added soap opera the right. movie is not about him learning the difference between no. being a lord and not it's it's it, about nothing and so all <laughs> of <laughs> this is cotton candy the movie all of that stuff just like why are we spending time on this and i yeah. well, i like christian slater and everything but i i feel like them being half brothers make his whole point so much his hatred of robin i love and I'm just like, fuck you, rich boy, automatically. Yeah. And then when he's like, here's why, I'm like, no, that kind of, that takes a lot of the guts out of it. Just for like a poor guy to be like, you suck for these reasons, like rules. And part of the reason Will Scarlet is so mad is because he started believing in Robin Hood. Mm. He's like, and I hate that I did that. I, when he finds out, that's one of the most important mo- uh, moments in the movie and maybe one of the most important movie moments in history because the one thing that everybody knows about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, he does it in this second. He says, I have a brother. <laughs> I have a brother. Back to back <laughs> gives us both. I what I like is you can tell they are related is both of them do the same mm-hmm. bo- <laughs> shitty English accent yes. throughout the movie. Fuck me. He cleared it. Fuck me. He cleared <laughs> it. That uh, was an ad lib that Kevin, what's his face, was just like, it's too funny to not cut. <laughs> and also when okay, they Okay, la- that is like the funniest moment of the movie. Though. When they land that perfectly in the hay, yeah. Yeah. chickens pop directly yes. up. <laughs> um I think one thing that this could have used that other Robin Hoods have is Give him a jaunty little hat. Yeah. The, this movie does something really weird, which I didn't notice because it was the 90s, early 90s, and we just didn't know what to do w- with boys' hair. He like, had we the just even had flow hair. No idea. But Kevin Costner, in with his long prisoner hair, not so bad. <laughs> it That looked like an actual hairdo that uh-huh. somebody might have. And then off screen, he clearly has Azim use his, like, falchion to just, like, as quickly <laughs> as possible hack off, like, most of his hair. And then he has these flyaways yeah. for the rest of the movie because all of the hair up at the front is, like, six inches long. And so it's got the, he's got this, like, really power mullet. <laughs> and then everything it's Robin on the in front, the front hood in the back. is these, like, weird flyaways. Man, get a hat on that. Yeah. Like, let's take care of this hair. Right you know what? I think they, for both... Uh, Boys and girls, Robin Hood is cool. Like, yeah. he's got this, like, cool, I want to be him. Like, he's sexy. And Kevin Costner, I don't think, is capable of sort of being that, like... Suave. Suave, but also, like, I'm a little... Uh, I don't know. I could, like, dance back and forth between genders, you know? like Yeah. I, a little fae. A little fae. He's a man yeah. of the woods, after and, all. And not so, like... No. I'm fucking yeah. Robin Hood. Yeah, like Kevin Costner is so afraid that for a second you're going to think he's not like all man. Right. And that's definitely not Robin Hood. I, I think another thing you have to have is you have to have like a Jackie Chan style actor where the camera can literally stay on his face mm-hmm. as he Does puts his foot shit. on the, the chandelier and right. then cuts the rope. And we know that it's like we have to have the performer do it because that's what Errol Flynn did. So you can't have an Errol Flynn type performance I, if you don't have that ability. Think about what Robin Hood's need. Errol Flynn had it. The Fox had it. Uh, I think Kara the Fox Alloway's had it for fucking days. But it, it is it is that it is that like Devil May Care Han Solo aspect. But like the Russell Crowe Robin Hood sucks. The I've never seen it, but I can't even imagine it. Is like, it yeah. Russell Crowe is it's Robin. It's not Hood. Miles Teller, Ansel Inglevort, but one of those kid types is in a newer one. Like it's oh, like, it's a uh, Taron Egerton. Yes, yes. Kingsman. Who I do like, Taron Egerton, out of all those kids, the best. But like, it's not a good movie, and it, it really feels like we maybe it's too far gone. Like, we no longer can make a Robin Hood movie, and like, because nobody since Mel Brooks has tried to make commentary on what this kind of legend means. Where we can still make good westerns because people have that in their brains enough to be like, I'm making a cool western, and I'm talking about westerns and what it means to us. But people are just like, Robin Hood wears leather, has a bow. Yeah, but- I think really what you need is you need a deconstructed, simplified Robin Hood. I think we need a Robin Hood that like kind of sucks more i think there's perfect. moments of that here i think that like the problem is that they're again they're trying to do 75 Everything. different yes. things and whatever idea they had that day they just set it to, to film there's moments where like let's say in the third act the plan is going awry and everybody looks at robin hood and he's clearly like oh, i don't know <laughs> i think we're <laughs> fucked and that's i that's sort of like this it's hard to be robin hood man like it's really hard i'm just a normal dude yeah, and yeah. people treat me like a superhero but 
it's also intermixed with he's a superhero. Right. So, like, which one are we? We don't get. He is kind of like one of the first ever superheroes, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that like that's really he is larger than life. It's not supposed to be that he sucks. Cause he's a super spy. He's a superhero. That inclination to do, let's say, Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, but every once in a while, go like he closes his bedroom door and he's just like, "Fuck, I'm so nervous. This is so I'm hard." Never marry, and they want me to be merry all the time. Also. How about have him be someone that doesn't go to the Crusades? Yeah. It's so weird the way in the background of all of these nice, really, movies, because that is ultimately the message is very nice. It's like, well, we're back from genociding in Jerusalem, yeah. and, the, and now we're going to fix things in England. And you can't like take his, over my country while I was over there t- trying he, to take over some other country. His fight with his dad was that his dad was like, the Crusades are useless, don't do this. And we're like, <laughs> and we're supposed to, his dad's a secret villain of the movie? Like, I don't know. I'm maybe pro Lord Loxley. I think the secret uh, villain of the movie is Duncan. That fucking blind old fuck. Like he's he obviously caused everything. I think it's I think it's fucking King Richard who leaves yeah. to go plunder um, the Holy Land somewhere he has no right to be at all. Uh, and also, then, like that wedding at the end, he yeah, was not invited. He just comes he, back. And, 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 and the, at a certain point, they're like, "We'll send it to France." So he plundered Jerusalem, left a bunch of his dudes there, and was like, "I'm going to party in France for a few years, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to go home." And like, it's really he does not get enough blame Mm-mm. for the fact that he's off adventuring like uh pillaging doing all sorts of ter- terrible stuff and that's why some maniac is allowed to just do whatever he right. wants with his kingdom and it's just like he comes back and everyone's like oh thank goodness this guy's here again he's gonna make everything better when we come back let's talk about the tune hey guys thank you so much for listening so far and let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to Pop Filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's yourpopfilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! Gentlemen, part of what is so enduring about this movie is the music, both its incredible score and its unforgettable titular song. Well, I guess not titular song. I don't know. Robin Hood, you (laughs) are the Prince of Thieves. What is this? You. How do these work in the context of the movie? I think the Brian Adams song, which is his best selling song ever, which is kind of crazy, and either has lyrics that are based on actual lines from the movie. Everyone is always like, oh, I do it for you. Or <laughs> there are lines in the movie that use lines from his <laughs> song. And it can't be that way, right? There's no, no way that's it. Yeah. They're like, we'll rewrite the script because Brian Adams. I, I do he remember just Will wrote Scarlet such a banger. saying, I got my first real six string at a certain point in the song. <laughs> but the, the, that song is why I think the parts that work the best are that romance. Because... That's the only version of this movie, and we've talked about how there's 20 different versions of this movie. The only version that goes with that as the theme song to the whole movie uh-huh. is the spinning them spinning down on the rope, and it's all about this this <laughs> this epic <laughs> romance about the two of them finding each other throughout history. Yeah, that which I agree that that is an okay scene. Do do they have any chemistry? I feel like no. they've got like negative chemistry. They do on the when screen. they're very, very, very far apart from each other. <laughs> because there's when a point acting where against tennis balls. My wife and I have that. <laughs> where Maid Marion sees his butt from two miles away yeah. and can't speak. She just like, goes shooing. <laughs> yeah, dude. She goes into some fugue state because little Costi's butt butt is down there. Uh, that that scene, thinking of more times I could get points if this was a real show. Uh Costner wanted to do it. He wanted to show Maid Marion his real Costner ass. But uh, the producers and everybody were so afraid he'd get hypothermia, so they said no. So, like, the stuntman can get hypothermia, though, right? Yeah. Because it's a real ass. But could they find a stuntman with a butt? I know white people are not gifted in that area, but that's. Yeah, he's got the one. Slash Ryan butt. (laughs) Okay, yeah, there's nothing there. And she's like, oh my. Like, what is she. I think he's got a big old bow sized dick. 
<laughs> I know Bull is the one who's famous for having the dick. I like how her like uh, lady in waiting or whatever, yeah. after they totally look at his butt, is like, he could have just told us that he, this is what he was doing. <laughs> She's very right. They, yeah. the, the merry men are so dumb. I love okay, it. Okay, I have another question, and it's like the first one. So obviously, there's no way they took lyrics from the song and put it into the movie. <laughs> okay, but there are flourishes in the score yes. that are that song. Which way did that go? Did he write his song based on the score? Dude, or but there's no reason to believe that Brian Adams wrote a single fucking thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> no music, no lyrics, no nothing. He, and I didn't do any research, but it's fucking Brian Adams. His name rhymes with Ryan Adams. Like, how great could he be? <laughs> I just, I guess I didn't realize how, what an easy job he had. Because, yeah, like, yeah. the song, is it crazy to say that the score and this song have both managed to be bigger than the yes. movie itself. The score slaps. The da 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 the score so fucking is cool. Amazing. I listened to a podcast interviewing Rick Astley recently, and he was an intern at some uh, recording studio of like much more famous bands, and they wrote this song, and they were like, "This isn't working. That seventeen-year-old is pretty hot. Let's just see if he'll sing it." He did not write any music, did not write any lyrics, ruined his fucking life. They thought that <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall motherfucker was pretty hot. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> Man, anytime you're having a conversation and then somebody says that 17 year old's pretty hot, don't be friends with that person. I think anymore. it's time. But like, are there th- there's forces of my heart will go on in Titanic, right? Yeah. I think this is a pretty common thing. I, I think the the scorist, uh-huh. the, is scorist that the, yeah. the scorist, the scorist is very good and is like, oh, do you know what's gonna fucking blow their minds when they get to those credit songs? Yeah. I'm gonna take some of this. This is. One of the more iconic jo- non-John Williams scores of our lifetime, mm-hmm. I would say. It became, this. the sub-production company is Morgan Creek. It became their yeah. song oh, after this. Yeah. I love it. It's so good. They're like, that's ours now. That's and Morgan Creek. even crazier is that this was after my time. So if you're younger than me, you might remember this. But uh, before any uh, v- uh, Disney movie would play, if you like bought it on DVD, there would be this like Disney worlds of magic and wonder and it would show clips from the movies and they use robin hood a fox song disney has a f- treasure trove of music they could right. have used but they were so in love with the robin hood prince of thieves theme that they used that over it yeah so this song like this main yeah. theme is a big deal everything about this movie was like a major letdown to me not that i thought it's definitely going to be good but it was just such a big step down from kid who watches it <laughs> twice a year <laughs> Except for the score. I was like, I don't think I really... I think I enjoyed the score as a kid. I think it it was like good cinematography. I felt what it wanted me to feel without Mm -hmm. being aware of it. But because I was like grinding my teeth with how bad some of these (laughs) scenes were, I was really blown away by the score. Like it it was among... You had said, Ryan, uh, we talk offline sometimes. Uh, not on you guys show. do yeah and you had said ryan that you had almost wished that we had included it in the list of like 91 oh yeah amazing songs it's better than the brian adams shit um personal story about the song i uh, i was in a marching band in high school and i played what's called the tenors which is i have five different drums strapped to me love the song so much that i threw away the music and i just tried to guess what the melody was on my drums and just banged them as loud as I could. <laughs> and the whole time I was imagining that my mallets were on fire and I was going to shoot them at enemies. <laughs> uh, we didn't get a chance to talk that much about it, but uh, the character of Azim, I'm not comfortable with the, with the crusade things. Uh, a lot like of his being like, I'm sworn a life debt to you. Mm. I'm not your servant or your slave, but I am sworn to protect you no matter what. Putting all of that aside, which I know is a lot to put aside, not bad 91 was that like no in there's a book called real r-e-e-l real bad arabs and it's all about how through for most of hollywood these people are treated like dog shit way before 9-11 yeah uh and and but that this is one of the I mean, we've seen that in the in the movies of, that we did of 75 yes. like like that was like uh, uh, often that was the subplot was like scary this is one of the exceptions. Scarabs. And for such a dumb, dumb movie, to, dumb. If, if you were going to say this movie is about anything and does it successfully, it is he is smarter than all of them, yeah. he is more honorable than all of them, and uh, he saves the day with his speech where he screams, now he calls everybody English, not just Robin. Uh, Consider protecting yourself. Yeah, it's like, do you <laughs> see the bullshit you're living with? But he also waits till they think that they have the upper hand. Yes. Which is the whole thing is you make sure that peasants never think that. Right. Even though they might, and that's how you you know, lead. And and he, so he, he knows how to win a crowd. It feels like we don't get a lot of his life, but it feels like he maybe have, has been a leader before or maybe yeah. it's saying he's an everyman, but 
Arabs are just smarter than all of us. Well, it does still very much fall into the trap of like, oh, don't worry about my life. Yeah. Right. Don't worry about what and, I'm and up to. I'm there's definitely that like out. that mystical man of the East, yeah. even right. though he's from like the southern northern so part of a, Africa. It's not perfect. It's but not perfect. I just feel like even in the movies that have that are more recent than ninety one, it's a pretty it's pretty okay. Well, there's the the children that are racist are cute about it. Yes. And the adults who are racist. Oh, that died. little girl is adorable. Yeah. Did God paint you? Yeah. <laughs> But see, okay, was she being racist about his skin? Because the other thing is, doesn't he also have tattoos? He has I, tattoos. Yeah, they, they just carried out the Morgan Freeman yeah, freckles Morgan around Freeman his face. That freckles was such an tattoos. unusual choice. What if instead of his freckles, we just turned them they into tattoos? Deeper. And I spent the entire movie wondering about that, but that's why they call him the Painted Man. Yes. Right? I, real quick, well, for the listeners, probably, yeah. <laughs> I understand what his religion was uh-huh. and his Culture? Where is his? What is his country? More, he's a Moor, which right. is Northern North Africa. Africa. Northern Africa. Him yeah. and Othello hung out. Uh, gotcha. Different time periods, but but it was a glass or lake house situation where they yeah. would write letters they to each other. Like, I would watch the shit out of that movie. Uh, but what, what I like about it, as as a, a former Arabic speaker, is uh, he his relationship with Robin Hood, and Robin always kind of treats him the same. Though yeah. he does defend him pretty quickly to other people, which I enjoyed uh, and was shocked by the whole time. Uh, where he's like, he's a savage, but so are we. Yeah. Like, In- okay. Because but, uh, this, this is part of the baby steps. This is part of the ninety-one thing that's like, listen, everybody, there's no such thing as racism. Right. Stop worrying about it. <laughs> We're all bad. Yeah. I I'm mean, an equal opportunity offender. But uh, he goes from calling Robin uh, English to Sadiq, and Sadiq is uh, friend in Arabic. And I was just like, they used a real word. Good for them. They looked up one Christian too. Like yeah. that's how you're different than me. Uh, there's a lot of moments like that for Kevin Cost, like. Uh, J- little John screaming at Fanny, like, get the fuck back there and take care of the kids. Yeah. And then Robin of Loxley steps up and says, Fanny, you'll be positioned here. Yeah. Because I, this is equal opportunity as with the married men and women. And meanwhile, then the second, the husband and wife team, either one of them gets into trouble, the other one drops what they're doing and oh, tries yeah. to help. They, That's they why you can't put husband no. and wife team. They need to be in separate parts of the compound. Yeah. Definitely. But then we'd miss out on the best line of the whole fucking. Which was? Hello, me lover. <laughs> They are such a lover couple. Yeah. That's definitely the oh, kind of couple. It's like that's... Feral and Dratch in the jacuzzi. <laughs> yes, they would definitely start making out in jacuzzi, and then he goes, my back. <laughs> when we come back, it's time for some awards and recommendations. <laughs> well, that is very, very funny or very sad, and perhaps now you have something to think about, or very problematic, and perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at Your Pop Filter. Email contacts at Your Pop Filter. Hey, everybody. Keep watching them movies. Now, obviously, this movie deserved all the awards. And so tonight on this show, it will win all the awards. First, let's go with uh, Director's Signature. We've sort of been bad-mouthing this guy. What would you say is the director's signature, Mike? The one thing that felt like a choice, not like he gave the camera to his nephew. Uh, it, 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 remind, it remind me kind of parts of Little Prince, like when it gets real weird. And he does it specifically with the villains. Is this weird like fisheye lens mm, super close to him yeah. so you can see their pores and sweat. Uh, he does it on the lieutenant of the Nottingham a lot and the witch a lot and, and the sheriff every once in a while. But it makes them look so much scarier than the goofy doobers that they are yeah and also kind of makes you oddly like not sympathize with them but like you're so close to them yeah that you I, can see I don't... up their noses and you're like yeah. oh you're ugly like me yeah. like, <laughs> and it, it's almost like being a i mean heroes are pretty and villains are not yeah so like right. that's, that's how you can tell that's what he's accomplishing but it's also like you're in a drug state like you're in a uh, yes. this like uh crazed fever if robin did get his hand chopped off and this is his as he's Seriously. dying what do you see that's a great theory yeah the whole thing <laughs> takes place on the, the prison floor what do you say ryan mine is i have to go with the thing that became it's the most iconic it's the poster it's the slow motion fire arrow it's mm. the only thing he cares about yeah i that or the the just the arrow traveling right but the fire arrow was like that was one of those things where you didn't feel like it was spoiled by the preview no you felt like when it happened Pumped. and you were 10 in the theater you were just like yes i was waiting the whole time for this all right how about pound for pound <laughs> performance <laughs> i feel like this is about as up for grabs as it could possibly be ryan what do you say for pound for pound performance i knew for a fact before we put it on that alan rickman was going to get it right you know he's he's the 
pop culture hall of famer but it's morgan freeman who is the only one who can balance all of the tones yeah. there's sometimes where he does sort of bounce out of like a a period piece and does deliver a line like a, in, a, in a modern way mm-hmm. or in a more comedic way but i think just because there's clearly nobody more talented in this movie. Yeah, uh, he he's like, always a safe bet to be in the scene. His comedy works because it's dry. It's not like Wah! and look at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> like it is like oh no. Every once in a while, Azim has a dry sense of humor, and that works. Oddly, by not centering Azim, everything about him is actually kind of subtle. Yes, because the story's not about him in any way. So the only thing are like the little nods mm-hmm. that that he has, mm-hmm. and so that actually makes it a, a better performance. I one, like that. one example that we didn't talk about is that uh, everyone, when King Richard gets there, everybody bows except for Marion, who is noble blood, and Azim, who's just looking around like, "What the fuck are you guys doing?" Old fuck. <laughs> Where were you when we were fighting your war? <laughs> this Scottish guy is the king. <laughs> all of you, okay. <laughs> Thought that was later, but you think it's now. <laughs> Mike, who do you think has the P for P? I think B B, and it's similar to Azim. He's nowhere near as good an actor as Morgan Freeman in general. Played it's, by Dave it's Chappelle. It's a chew. Dave Chappelle. Uh, a sneeze was his father. Uh, it, it it is it's it's Wolf. I think it is wow. John and Fanny's kid because everybody else is tonally shifting all the time and it doesn't work. This kid gets who his character is th- the whole time when he is laughing at the guardsmen and scared. I buy it when he is trying to strangle. Uh, Christian Slater, I buy it. And I, I think a better version of this movie, there's so many better versions of this movie, but it would be he is the star and it's what's it like to be a little kid watching this asshole think he's a hero. Uh, and the, the wolf won me over. I Plus, like it. Uh, he's got an action hero line where you killed a king's deer, dozens of them, and then <laughs> yeah, sprints yeah. away. Yeah, he's got so much like, when he says saucy, dumb things, you're like, well, yeah, you're 10. Like, I love it. <laughs> also, like, forest people, Name their kid Wolf. Like, yes. that's just a thing that happens. Yeah, well, just you, the kid comes out and you look up and it's the first thing you see, right? Wolf! <laughs> All right, how about cringe? I feel like there's a lot of potential here. Mike, what do you say? It's Nottingham is a despicable character. Yeah. So I, I cut out I, for, so many lines could have been it. So what I'd landed on was uh, the weird, and I didn't get why Marion is suddenly a medieval ninja, <laughs> but. When Robin sees her maid pretending to be Marion and his, the years have treated you and you can hear somebody whisper, ellipses, kindly. Uh, <laughs> isn't it hilarious that he thought she used to be beautiful and now he doesn't? Like, I was just like, ew, what, why? Why are we doing this? I like that. That's pretty cringy. Ryan, what do you say? Um, so in this movie, Alan Rickman is trying to rape Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. And the specific part, you know, like, Mm. That could be sort of not cringy because he's a bad guy and whatever. But the way that the movie shoots, the final thing of like, I'm going to separate your yep. ankles with a music cue yeah. as almost like not a joke, but something like a, a stinger of the yeah. whole scene. It was shot like a joke. You are correct. And in 90 specific big broad, uh, mm. who are the bad brothers? The Farley brothers. It felt like a Farley brothers. Like, <laughs> And right after Thelma and Louise, which has like the same like kicking of the feet apart. Yeah. And mm. it's like such an upsetting moment. Yeah, it's like suddenly you wonder, like, wh- like what kind of movie am I watching that would like turn this into a weird, yeah, punchline? A slide whistle happens as it. <laughs> All right, now let's get to the particular awards for this movie. What is we said a bad Rickman line, Ryan? What is a what's the best Rickman line? I think this is a slam dunk. It's okay, because it's dull. You twit. It'll hurt dull, more. I say it all. The- Anytime yeah. anybody asks me, hey, why did blank in right. my life? Why did blank? Why did you not go to school today? Because it's dull, you twit. <laughs> It'll hurt more. What do you say, Mike? Do you agree? I I want, yeah, I love that line. Uh, I think it's why Ryan and I became friends, because we both automatically said something to dull, you twit. Uh, another one, uh, a silver medal, because I do think that one should win, is uh, that made me legit laugh and is clearly Alan Rickman and his two fucking pub comedy friends wrote it, was uh, there's just two extras that the movie could yes. ignore. And he's just like, you, be in my room at 10.30. You be, be in my room at 1045 and then his walk back and forth and go bring a friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was just like, all right. I also probably would have accepted that for cringe, but I have yeah. to say it's like the weird marriage of yeah. those two things because I was like, no, that's wrong. But <laughs> before we move on, I want to give a special shout somebody we haven't mentioned today who's very important to Jesus life <laughs> is uh, my life is uh, Michael Wincott, who plays Sir Guy of Gisborne, who was just in 
40 movies at this time. He's the one who says, why is Spoon Oh, that, that's the lieutenant? Yeah, and he plays that character in every early 90s movie. And well, he, When you have teeth I, like that and a voice like that. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of range, but he has that face and that voice. He could have so. been 90s Wolverine, man, if they made it then. Because Wolverine should be gross and little. All right. Who was the best merry man, Mike? The answer would have been so different at different periods of my life. As a seven-year-old, I was so into Will Scarlet. And then as a 10-year-old, I was so yes. into Little John. Uh, people people younger than us don't understand the power of Christian Slater Oh, my this God. Time. Christian Slater was just like, like, no part of me watched the Will Scarlet performance and went, oop, swing and a miss. Or no. maybe not even a swing. Maybe just the miss without swinging at all. I was like, this guy is so fucking cool. Obviously, yes. I hate him because currently he's beefing with Robin Hood. <gasps> but... He's so fucking cool. He's like Eddie Furlong grew up. And he, there's always this like, oh, he's this generation's blank. Right. But it's like a nebulous sort of. It changes. He's not always Jack Nicholson. <laughs> but uh, he said, I'm going to be this generation's Jack Nicholson by doing a constant impression of Jack Nicholson. Right. Like in interviews, in mm. every movie that I'm in. He never stops, well, including in this movie. I think he's more Jack Nicholson when he's being Christian Slater than when he's in <laughs> movies. <laughs> Christian. <laughs> Uh, I hope someday we get to do pump up the volume for this show. I uh, fucking I love fucking him love in that. that. Movie. Uh, but I, I think where I landed on now as an adult, uh, hello, me lover. I am obsessed with Fanny. I think she crushes it. She's the only cool, strong one. She gets what the world should be. I picked Fanny despite the show. Not, High five. Not being yes. scored. Because if this was a scored show, we would both say that because Greg would give us points yeah, for picking course. the female. But, uh, no, and she, a wife. I mean, she's notably a wife. But yeah, like... Uh, there's no none of that like oh I'm gonna put on airs no it, to like have this conversation I'm just like fuck you fuck that I'm Fanny she <laughs> dresses everybody down not because she also has an ego just because they need it where everybody time somebody else like digs on Robin it's because they want to feel beefier like and yeah. she's just like I get the world motherfuckers I've had eight babies uh, swings from a burning building to Little John when yes. Robin tried that. The rope burnt and he Shit. fell to his death. Little John is like, you protect the kids. And she's like, I'm protecting the one who needs it. The other kids are fine. Yeah, you seriously? shut up. You go protect the kids. <laughs> All right. Let's get to our recommendations. Mike, what do you recommend if, if you like this movie or so, don't like this movie? <laughs> if, if you're like, I want like a fun swashbuckling rising up against the uh, nobility I would say there's th there's a bunch of books in it, but the original Mistborn trilogy has such a good take on the Robin Hood story of a uh, they used to be yeah. a lord, they crawled their way out of literal death pit, and then started just like they, uh, Kelsier has a band of merry men. Like yeah. th there's so somebody wrote down it was like, well that's our fire talk, uh, that's our little John. But like such good fleshed out versions, like each of the characters in this in trilogy and you watch their own somebody story. move up from like the lowest level of that gang. Up yeah, to, yeah. And then she leads the gang by the end. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's done subtly well because it's not like and the girl should have it too. But it's just like slowly she's like, well, she has the skills of everybody and like quietly watches them and learns from it and. And that the story works on that level, yeah. But like, what's going on in the world in that trilogy is as interesting as anything in, yes. in fantasy. I'm not the biggest Sanderson fan, but that particular trilogy I, is what I would tell people. Yeah, to read that if trilogy they were gonna, rules, and yeah. it's been, I, I love Wax and Wayne. I like the Western version of it better. But I think if you want Robin Hood type shit, that first Mistborn trilogy is badass. So when me and Greg talk about sports, this is what it feels like. Yes. <laughs> do you see how that feels? Right? <laughs> I hated it. All right, Ryan. Or should I let me do my recommendation? Yeah, fuck Ryan. Uh, and my recommendation is uh, the Once and Future King by T. H. Uh, White. Yeah, uh, there is a big Robin Hood part, and the take on Robin Hood is so weird and so different, and I think more like uh, more like the sort of like legends of mm. Robin Hood. And um, that's the that's the book that uh, the Disney film The Sword in the Stone is based on. And just a really fun fantasy story that has magic and admits that it has magic. Right. Robin Hood it's does this thing that really annoys me, which is they're like, maybe there's magic, maybe there's not. But maybe they're crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, but it's like, either have it or don't. Well, that's the, the, as an adult, I was like, no, they have it. Because she's like, uh, fuck Robin Hood. Look out for Robin Hood's number two. He's the one who's going to kill us all. And then she's like, I was right. And he obviously knows about her. They both go, like the M&Ms in Santa Claus. They both go, you do exist. <laughs> he finds that tube and that undoes everything. That she like has a little hidey hole that she yeah. can listen to his conversations through. Speaking of Robin Hood, it's number two. How, much, how many times is this guy going to rub shit on himself in this movie? He loves it. Was he's that totally necessary? I don't think so, he, man. He, he kneels down to a dirt road and he's like, I guess because he wants hands. to smell so it, bad. that. But if you're trying to be sly and sneaky, every he's in the middle of the road. So the point extras turn around and look at him like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> like, let me tell you, bro. 
You live in the forest. You stink. Mary yeah. tells stink. him he stinks earlier in the movie. <laughs> and his clothes are probably dirty as shit. Yeah. Come on, man. What do you say, Ryan? What do you recommend, Daish? I'm, uh, I'm thinking of modern day Robin Hood. I'm thinking of somebody who uh, sort of is poor but so likable, so adventurous, is like out there to help the uh, people who have less than him. Has a partner, little John, who, you know, they fight at first, but they join up. The last Boy Scout is, I would say, <laughs> the modern day Robin Hood. <laughs> modern. <laughs> 1991's the last boy scout. Very modern. modern. For whatever reason, I thought you were going to say Moon Knight. <laughs> Moon Knight. It's like, yeah, he's pretty poor. I mean, it's like a homeless superhero. When he said he has little John, I thought it was going to be Usher. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, there is no chance Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. For dozens of reasons. But I think we've, we've watched some bad movies, right, in our lives and for the show. I think this is such an enjoyable bad movie. I do. I think I'm closer to Mike on this. I think it is an awful movie. But and then maybe it's just because I liked it as a kid. Yeah. But there is like, even though it misses in tones, like and the switching from tone to tone is doesn't isn't good. There are enjoyable moments. I don't know. I didn't totally. It wasn't boring. It wasn't bland. Never bored. There are. But I think Mike hit it on the head at the beginning of the show, which is something I can say because this is not a score show, <laughs> so I can agree with Mike. Uh, is that I, I was a child and then I learned about filmmaking, yeah. and I think the filmmaking is so piss poor. That it takes away the from work, all the stuff that I lo- that I like about the movie. The camera work at times is like this person has never seen a movie, right? Like just like does not know. And coming off of Thelma and Louise, where some of the, like the the intricate shots are like so impressive that you like want to write a paper mm-hmm. on them. Just the rumble camera running upstairs in this is like so unusual. The big thing about action movies or action scenes that we talk about on this show is spacing. Like yes. Positioning. Do we know where everybody is? Yeah. So we can move to a close up and still be okay. The fights and make sense. When the the Act Three thing is okay, but when the Celts attack the village, it's oh, fucking gibberish. The burning dude. of Ewok Village yeah. is bananas. <laughs> oh, fun fact: they they sold uh, the Robin Hood, the Sherwood Forest, and it really was just a repackaged Return of the Jedi Ewok Village. They wow. changed nothing in the forest. You were serving on this show, <laughs> yeah, dude. for nothing. I I love this show. <laughs> or wait, I, I do, you know what? You know, no, we I do all love, love this, this show. show. And let that be the last thing. Oh, that would have been twelve points for you. <laughs> this is good. Tune in next week. But in the meantime, hey, keep watching them movies.